Masonic Life Podcast. This is Past Master Moyer calling with my review critique of episode 110 entitled Holiday Show slash Year in Review. Well, what can I say about this episode? I guess it speaks for the year 2020. It sucked. Uh, Not one of your best efforts, but I understand since uh, we didn't have the holiday happenings at the Valley of Reading, uh, hope, hopefully we'll have that in 2021. Anyway, there are a couple things you guys touched on. I agree with Larry. The uh, du- edition of Dutchy Doug and Broken Plow Lodge number 377 um, was a great edition in 2020. I had forgotten about the Knights of the Quarantine and Zoroaster. I forget which one of you brought that up. Uh, Tim, you mentioned the uh, toast Taps and friends, brothers at your lodge conducted last year, which was great. And let's see what else. You mentioned the cigar at Ben at the Valley of Reading. I was there. That was most enjoyable. Anyway, brothers, uh, I'm glad 2020 is over. Hopefully we'll all be vaccinated in the next few months and we can move on and start meeting as brothers. Happy New Year. I'll be in touch. Bye. From the new recording lair located deep beneath the Wine and Spirit Store in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. You're listening to the Masonic Light Podcast. Studio 665 presents Masonic Light Podcast. This show is recorded by Masons, for Masons, and is for entertainment purposes only. And please, no wagering. This podcast is not endorsed by any Grand Lodge, and the ridiculous ramblings of the hosts are their own. And now, here's your host. And welcome, everybody, to Masonic Light Podcast, episode 112. 112. Or in the Masonic world, 112. For that. Sorry, Moyer. Oh, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, Larry, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Why? Oh, I'm just wondering <laughs> if you want to tell our audience about... Did you hear, did you hear uh, that question almost asks itself. Come on, Larry. What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear any rumors about me or anything, did you? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Uh, Larry, why don't you uh, tell everybody who our guest is tonight? Well, sure, I'd be be happy to do that. Our guest this evening is a uh, young man. I say young man because as age goes, he's a very young man to be a chief petty officer in the United States Navy. Our guest is uh, Chief Petty Officer Corey McClare, and he's been on active duty for, I saw three hash marks on his sleeve, so that indicates 12 years, so he's not quite 16 years yet, but... He became a chief very, very at a very young age. So let me say that is quite an accomplishment right there. So he is our guest tonight. He is a brother Mason, a member of Lamberton Lodge, 476 Lancaster, and uh, <laughs> glad to have him on the show. Yep. Hey, Larry, Larry, Larry. That's enough. Larry. Okay. That's cool. Larry, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> okay. No, I'm we don't need to do that. Be our guest. Be our guest. Be our guest. Be our guest. Corey, welcome to the show. Um, unfortunately, have you ever heard us before? Uh, yes, I have heard of them on this podcast before. I've listened to a couple of your episodes. You know, it's it's good times. You know, witty banter all around. So witty banter. All right. Yeah, uh, you're going to be the full um, quote for the ad. <laughs> so now's the time in the show where we go around and we ask everybody what they've been up to. So Sweet. Jack, whoa, yes. What have you been up to? Oh, what? Uh, nothing really. I uh, got into a a minor kerfuffle uh, over procedures at the lodge because you know how we do love our procedures. And uh, but I just backed away and let it all wash through. I've been at it, I've been at this long enough to know that certain things you just just kind of you know nod your head and step back and. And just wait it out. And um, so, you know, we learn all kinds of lessons in Freemasonry, right? 
Absolutely. So that's one. Other than that, I've just been waiting for my family to come home. From where? New England? New England? Uh, yeah, they're up in uh, Taxachusetts with the Stephanie's up there with the grandbaby. And uh, so I'm alone in beautiful downtown Ephrata. And uh, Tim, Tim, have you done anything Masonically related? Just getting all the notices and uh, getting ready for the stated meeting of Eureka West Shore Lodge number 302. Uh, that is to occur uh, actually the day this show drops, February the 1st. Larry Maris, have you done anything? No, no. Uh, actually, we can always count on Tim because he seems to have done the most of anything of anybody been, since we've been having this uh, this uh, shutdown. But no, I haven't done anything. Listen, Grid Iron's still on sabbatical. Hope to get it back and running in the um, beginning of April. That's that's pretty much it. Josh, you're the only one that's really super active, right? I, I guess so, um, although we're not really too active at the moment um i guess we're going to be uh staying virtual through uh through march the beginning of march and then we're gonna mm. revisit it from there brother Corey, have you done anything uh masonically related or navy related oh man navy related is every day you know long working hours but uh on the masonic front uh not so much you know uh, being on a ready five ship, you really don't have a lot of time to sit there and plan anything out past a week. Um, you just get it in. You meet you meet a couple of masons here and there. You know, you, you find those guys and you just try to interact with them as much as possible and see what's going on with their lodges. That's pretty much the only way I really connect through masonry down here in Virginia. You know, I don't really have a lodge down here. I just talk to other masons in the military. Very cool. Uh, let's see. What do I have going on? I have just been planning the Pennsylvania Grotto Association spring kerfuffle. Um, that'll be April 23rd, 24th, 25th at the Holiday Inn Lancaster. So look for us on Eventbrite or Facebook and uh, it'll be a good time. And we're going to put on the Pennsylvania Dutch Farm Degree. I don't know exactly what it is, but I know that our own Dutchy Doug will be doing the prologue. So it sounds exciting. And our good friend and past guest, Chris Gibson. Correct. And also, who else? Is, it'd be also Alan Moyer and Ray Gottschall in the cast. So it's a uh, star-studded cast of, of now, illustrious it, brothers. Is, is that a benefit degree? Or is, it, is there a fee for services? Where does the money go? What's, what's going on? So, yeah, so it's a $20 donation, and because it is the Lancaster County Shrine Club that actually, you know, they kind of own the rights to this degree. Um, I don't know whether it's official or unofficial, but anytime you do anything related to the shrine, the Shriners Hospital is the designated charity. So, yeah, so if there's any profit when we're done, um, all money will go to Shriners Hospital for Children. Uh, in Philadelphia. When all profits are done, does that mean before the bar bill is paid? <laughs> I'm just very valid asking, question. asking for a friend, right? Yeah. <laughs> Chris Gibson is in charge of the money, and uh, there is no more honest person than Chris Gibson. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And, uh, and even if somebody conked him over the head and stole it, he would write a check out of his own money and, and make it. <laughs> he <smell>. would. <laughs> He's a good man. Uh, yes, he is. All right. So today, this episode is brought to you by our Patreons. Tim, will you tell everybody about that? Sure. Uh, we really appreciate the support of um, our patrons on Patreon.com. Uh, they keep this show going. And for as little as $1 a month, <gasps> $1, just a dollar, you can be a contributor um, at the entered apprentice level of the show. Um, and you can do that by going to patreon.com slash Masonic Light Podcast. All right. Well, let's take a quick break and we're going to come back and we're going to talk to uh, Chief Petty Officer Brother Corey when we come back. Why choose George J. Grove and Sons for your next home improvement project? 
At George J. Grove & Sons, we've built our reputation on quality and trust for more than 50 years. For planning to materials to installation, George J. Grove promises a home improvement experience second to none. Whether your goal is reducing energy costs, decreasing maintenance, updating curb appeal, or simply increasing the value of your home, the George J. Grove team will recommend and provide solutions that stand the test of time. Call 717-393-0859 for an estimate or visit us at georgejgrove.com. Our guest again this evening, and I'll, I'll reiterate and repeat it, uh, is our Chief Petty Officer, Corey McClare, who is on active duty serving on the hospital ship, the USNS Comfort. And there's going to be some good stories about this because, and well, first off, Corey, welcome. We're glad to have you. Tell us a little bit about your Navy career, because I think I mentioned you're one of the youngest Chief Petty Officers I've ever known. So tell us about that. <laughs> Well, uh, t- to be fair, you know, it's a uh, to be fair, huh? <laughs> to be fair. Um, I- I've been around the world and-, and back again, but you know, it is what it is. Um, I've been all over the place, deployed multiple times, attached to, uh, two destroyers. You know, that's the best, uh, best life in the Navy right there on a tin can. Oh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, you- oh yeah. Best sleep of your life too. I oh, promise oh, you. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we sit there. And uh, we're just out there sailing, you know, having a good old time. Um, what was the other parts of the question? I got lost in conversation there. Sorry. <laughs> Larry, Larry can do that to you. That happens when you hang around Larry too much. Yeah, your, your Navy career and something I said about you being, I feel, and, and having been known in the Navy like, like I did years past, becoming chief at uh, as young as you did it is definitely definitely something to be very proud of because it's very very larry larry let's rewind uh i'm a civilian so Corey, um tell us take us from the beginning you know kind of short course when when did you join the navy i joined the navy back in uh 2003 at uh at the lancaster uh recruitment center so joined out of there went to a boot camp up in chicago did a couple weeks there you know they taught me all the fun stuff you know medical history and then you know just basic seamanship before they send you off to a school uh went to msa school down in san antonio texas then uh you know get to my first ship which was the uh uss chung hoon but it was a uh, it was a pre-com unit so i wasn't initially attached to a ship because a pre-com unit is a ship that's being built so after about a uh, six to nine months in the training program and pipeline for pre-com units i was sent down to Pasadena, mississippi um, down in Pasadena, Mississippi, that's when we're bringing everything on board. You name it, fire hoses, you know, spanner wrenches, DC equipment, you know, everything. We have to bring it onto the ship because there's literally nothing there but the shell. Um, then you're going through crew certs and stuff like that to get the ship to come to life. And then once you sit there and get the ship to come to life, you're now considered a plank owner, which is a very rare thing for some sailors in the Navy. You know, you'll, you'll always be a plank owner of that ship no matter what. Um, after that, uh, God, I got out of Mississippi and we sailed it around to our home port out in Hawaii and yeah, it's out there chilling like Elvis, you know, killing the game, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, deployed three times out there, part of the, you know, one of the expeditionary units, you know, it's in the bio, you know, you can read it. It's cool. Well, you, but, you uh, gotta be careful. Yeah. My, my cousin broke his leg in the Navy in, in uh, Hawaii playing volleyball. It's very dangerous there. I mean, they were probably reenacting a Top Gun scene. Let's be real. So, was he an officer? Because <laughs> that would make sense. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, it's a it's a thing. It happens, you know. <laughs> so, uh, for like I said, I'm a civilian. So, Larry's going to say MOS, but I'm going to say, what is your job? What do you? What is your profession in the in the Navy? Uh, so. When I first came in, I was a mess specialist, but that has since changed to a culinary space uh, specialist to make us more, uh, I guess, 
conveniently named to make us good to transition into the civilian sector. So basically I'm a cook. All right. Uh, I cook food for everybody, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, three hots in a cot. You know, that's my job. I'm the, I'm the king of morale on the boat. Cause you know, you're out at sea six to nine months seeing the same mugs every day. Sometimes the life and uh, the life changer is going to be that food that you serve on the line. And uh, that's so what I do. That, what's that look like? I mean, is that, I have an image in my head of what it looks like to feed, you know, a couple, what, a thousand guys, five, 500 guys on a boat. How many guys are on the boat? Uh, it depends on which platform you go to. So DDGs, depending on which, uh, which flight you were on, that could be anywhere from 290 to 320, 330, depending on if you right, had an so air crew a, on board. That's a reasonably sized restaurant then. Yeah. So oh, what, yeah. what does chow look like for those guys? Oh man, it's the best in the world, dude. I'm telling you right now, you know, we serve better than Air Force. Oh, dude, that's only because we don't have private chefs like the Air Force. We're not that fancy, <laughs> you know, so it's good. But uh, yeah, we we uh, we make it happen for the crew. You know, we're on a 21 day cycle menu. Uh, we try to switch it up every now and again. Throw special meals. You know, try to throw some nice uh, desserts in there. Um, we're trying to bring back uh, scratch cooking because for a while there, we went uh, into a phase where the Navy was trying to go to a lot of ready made products to. Uh, save man hours but a lot of skills were being lost you know bakers couldn't make bread but you know or you can't even make spaghetti sauce like that type of deal you know so we're bringing back more scratch cooking nowadays so you got kids that are actually learning how to be you know i wouldn't say we're seasoned chefs you know some people got that drive that love that passion but so if you're ever stranded on a desert island you'll be the go-to guys Oh, I can make yeah. I can make some things work. Yeah, All absolutely. Right. You, give yeah. me fire, you know. Give me fire. It's good. We're on Survivor. Where's Wilson? <laughs> One of the things, Corey, you are leading chief on your current duty station, which is the uh, the the Comfort, the USNS Comfort, uh, which is the hospital ship stationed out of Norfolk. So you're leading chief. So you have a lot of management responsibilities on top of making sure everything else works. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, on my current ship, uh, I have roughly about 120 people when I'm fully activated that I'm responsible for. It's a it's a fun time to say the least. <laughs> you know, you got 120 people, 120 problems. Yeah. Uh, depending on some, it's even more. But you know, you got you got to make a make the line. By being a cook, uh, after you make E5, you're more of an accountant anyway. You know, you're responsible for you know the pricing of the food, making sure the food that you bring out is uh you know you got to watch a certain budget you just can't sit there and throw steak and lobster every day because you know we're not the air force it's good. you know we're gonna throw that zinger out there again but uh you know you gotta you have to you have to really sit there and manage a budget you know and that's actually my main job as a leading chief uh petty officer as a cs is to make sure that i can put out quality meals daily to meet a certain budget essentially that's my job so yeah one of the things I wanted to ask you too, Corey, was you became interested as an active duty member of the military in Freemasonry. And I mm-hmm. think your uncle Larry said something about the fact that you met a couple guys or one one individual in particular who was a Freemason and was talking mm-hmm. to you about it. Tell us a little bit about that background and why you decided to uh, join uh, our lodge. So uh, my mentor and uh, my chief at the time was uh, Brother Carlos Eldridge. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about things a lot, you know, and as an LPO to chief, you know, that's kind of one of the, like the, the biggest bonds that you can have because your LPO pretty much safeguards the chief and runs everything and the chief, you know, protects everything else down. So, of course, you got a lot of uh, just, just conversations about things. And, you know, you notice, you know, the rings and, the ta- you know, tattoos and, you know, other symbolism that goes along with it. And, you know, just start asking questions. And uh, I've known Larry was a Mason for years, you know. And, you know, he always just kind of, like, poked and prodded, like, well, you know, why not? You know, you know? Then the one day I was sitting at uh, <laughs> at Larry's house, and I was like, you know what, how do you become one? And, uh, you know, he showed me the light. So here I am today, you know. I mean, honestly, it was more about the brotherhood. Um, being in the military, you look left, you look right, and uh, you see people that you know that you can trust, and then if you ever needed anything, they had your back you know they're they're just gonna say all right who, your car or mine type deal you know what i'm saying and the way i hear people describe that brotherhood at that time was pretty much the same concept and i was like you know <clears throat> what better place to be than in a room with like-minded individuals you know yeah terrific. that's that to me is it's not there's nothing better than that I'll relive so a that bit is of exactly that. why i came 
I'm, t- I'm sorry, I'll relive a little bit of a story. You uh, became a member of the Lamberton Lodge on a Saturday, and we had to yeah. get a special dispensation from the Grand Lodge in order to do that. You yep. came in in your dress blues as first class petty yep. officer. I think you had made chief, but you still couldn't wear the chief's uniform in dress blues to come in to be initiated as member of our lodge. And I'm going to tell you, that was one proud moment to see you in those dress blues for everybody that participated in that degree. Well done. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> Gives me goosebumps. So, Corey, how often, how often does your Uncle Larry talk to you about the Masonic Center? <laughs> Oh, I, every time I call him, you know, he's always in there uh, tinkering with something, you know. So, you know, I heard about the uh, the new ACs that went in, you know, he's putting in plugs here and there, whether it's in the blue room or, you know, down in the amphitheater, you know, it's always something, but it's it's always good to be informed, you know, because it's, uh, it's your lodge, you know, what, what better place than to uh, hear the news from the, the guy who's putting keeping it together, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's a good man. I, I followed him um, well, long after him as master, but um, as Grand Tall Cedar, he was uh, right before me, and uh, yeah, he's got a big heart. So, oh, absolutely, absolutely, he's a good, he's a very good man. There's nothing in the right, world well, that I wouldn't run past him. Let's take a quick break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to hear more from uh, Brother Chief Petty Officer Corey. At the historic Smithton Inn of Ephrata, Pennsylvania, we're pleased to serve the latest creations from Weathered Vineyard Winery, along with spirits from Thistle Finch Distillery in Lancaster, all to be experienced in the tasting room of a beautifully restored 18th century bed and breakfast. Cigars by DNS Cigar are available for your enjoyment in the courtyard. The historic Smithton Inn is convenient to Lancaster County's most interesting attractions just minutes from the Ephrata Cloister and the Green Dragon Farmer's Market. And a short drive can get you to charming Lidditz, thriving downtown Lancaster, as well as Hershey, Bird in Hand, and Intercourse, or Valley Forge and Gettysburg. Whether you're looking for a romantic getaway or an active vacation full of sightseeing and attractions, the historic Smithton Inn will be a welcoming oasis from everyday life, one that you'll want to visit again and again. Stop in and visit at 900 West Main Street in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, or check out our website at historicsmithtoninn.com, or simply call us at 717-733-6094. Just ask for Past Master Dave. Alrighty. Hey, welcome back, everybody. We're back here at Masonic Light Podcast with our regular cast and our guest, uh, Brother Corey, um, who is a Chief Petty Officer in the U.S. Navy, and he's currently serving aboard the Comfort, the the medical ship that uh, was kind of in the news a little bit at the beginning of the COVID crisis. Um and, you know, it goes all over the world helping people, too. So, uh, Corey, tell us a little bit about that uh, whole experience and, you know, what that was like being in the Navy when the COVID thing first ramped up. <laughs> well, it was, uh, it was interesting, to say the least, uh, <laughs> just to be put that one out there. But, uh, you know, when you're on, a, on board a medical ship like this, you're, uh, you're made to be in a ready five status. You know, you don't really have planned deployments, but, you know, you got five days, you, you get the button to go, you go. Um, you load up, you know, your food, your medical equipment, and, you know, you bring on medical professionals to sit there and take quality care no matter where you go. And, uh, you know, that was the case for, uh, New York. So, uh, you know, we, we were reading in the news, you know, you see everything going on. It was spiking bad, you know, then their, uh, infrastructure was getting just pummeled, pummeled. So initially we were supposed to go up there just to, uh, handle major trauma, you know, uh, say there was bad traffic accidents or, you know, um, gunshot wounds, you know, things of that nature, like emergency traumas. We were just basically going to try to relieve the efforts of the infrastructure there for that. But, uh, you know, it, it changed rapidly. It was one day we were, we were not next thing, you know, we're taking COVID patients. So along with that, it, uh, became a lot of, uh, strict sanitation measures, you know, not even just down in the, the wards, but all over the vessel because, you know, we're, we're establishing things to, you know, protect the crew. And, you know, I tell you right now, watching, you know, medical professionals work day in, day out to, to do nothing but help people, you know, just effortlessly, effortlessly, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing to see. 
And it's not even just the medical professionals that are doing stuff. You know, you got other divisions that are bringing, you know, the ship to life as well. You know, we have a O2N2 plan on board so we can provide medical grade oxygen. You know, you have your supply services with food and laundry and, you know, stuff like that. Everything is running full bore and it's 24 hour care. You know, if an ambulance showed up at, you know, one in the morning, you know, you're, you got guys down on the pier ready to go and bring that patient up and process them through Kazrak. You know, it's a, uh, it's definitely a humbling experience to see that. So I can't think of a more confined environment in, in which COVID, you know, could potentially spread than a Navy, than a ship, you know, you're, the- you're like there, you're, you're, you're anyway, um, how how well and i know you can't be specific or anything but overall um what precautions did you take and how well did would how well did it work um we established uh basically what we were calling red zone green zones like immediately um basically anybody that was working down in the icus or you know basically handling with patients um because that's basically all we had coming on board after that was covid positive patients you know we just kind of like segregated them throughout the ship you know between these zones and uh we ended up moving majority of them off ship so that way the people that were on board uh had less chance you know to get the that the virus because we're interacting with those personnel and uh you know we, we like i said we had a great team we uh we had no uh covid positive p- uh patients that came off of our crew so just wow uh, like I said, that's like amazing I said, the hard work that, that yeah, is it was, incredible that's amazing it was a it was a sight to see, you know, like I said, you have guys that have strict protocol and you operate under those strict protocols day in, day out. And you have to be like that. Cause if not, once again, you look left, you look right. And your decision affects not only you, but the person that's next to you, you know, and so on and so forth with the way this virus can spread. So we have, wow. we had a lot of things up and running and we just maintained our, uh, our vigilance with the protocols that were put in place. And the goal line constantly changed. It constantly changed. Um, cause you had, you know, you had new information coming about coming out about the virus that you had to, you know, you had to go in and try to put it and implement more mitigating strategies to it. So you all really were mm-hmm. learning as you were going along too with this. Oh, oh, facts. In New York facts. Harbor. Yes. I mean, you yeah. were right. You were yeah. right there. Oh, yeah. Down. yeah. Talk about ground. We were, in, we were sitting in, sitting in hell's kitchen. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, it was great. It was great. West side Manhattan. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. Except you can't. You, except you're busy working, and if you were even and nothing's able to open, ship, and nothing's <laughs> open. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the the city of New York uh, really opened up its arms though to us because they they knew what we were doing. You know, the, you uh-huh. know they they had people you know walking by holding up signs. You know, they were they were real appreciative of it. You know, that's and they great. Knew that we were there to try and make a difference. And what more of a positive you know influence could you have? You know, you see the USNS comfort rolling through, you know, the Hudson river up to hell's kitchen and it's rolling right under statue of Liberty. You know, you know, it's, it's there for a reason. It's there to help people. And that's honestly the true purpose of the hospital ships. We're not a combatant. We're not, you know, there to put warheads on foreheads like every other Navy vessel. We're there to help people. (laughs) You see that red cross, you know, help is on the way. And that, that it's, it's a humbling experience being on board this vessel for real. Very cool. So where else? Yeah, where else has that um, in your tenure, or, or like you know, in, to your knowledge, the ship been? Because I think one of my, I'm not sure whether it was that hospital ship or the other big one. One of my friends did some uh, volunteer eye surgery in some, I don't know, third world country, and I think that's they did it on the ship. Yeah, um, when we go out, sometimes we take uh, civilian medical practitioners out with us. You know, just you know. To, to help out. And then you have uh, doctors, you know, basically showing new strategies to, you know, to do certain uh, techniques during surgeries or new implementations for procedures for whatever insert every doctor, you know, category, subcategory you could have, you know, we, we typically carry it. And uh, I've been on CP 18, uh, comfort deployment 19. Um, I was actually stationed on it back when I was uh, a lowly CS2. Uh, I went down to the Haiti response in 2010 and CP09. So it's not my first rodeo on this ship, but you know, you go down to some of these countries and their infrastructure, like when you start going to some of the South American countries, like some of these people are like in villages up on mountains, they don't have access, you know, to the medical care, like anybody that would live in a highly 
um, populated area. So we're setting up medical camps like up there to try and help these people. You know, it, you see it all over the place when, when we go anywhere down south or to the Caribbean or wherever they happen to send us. You know, we're we're just there to help the the local population. Corey, when you were down in Haiti, that was that when they had the earthquake or the storm that totally devastated the country. Yep, that was uh, the the earthquake down there. I was, that was yeah, that was that was probably one of the worst things I've seen. Yeah, exactly. So you were right there yeah. in the midst of all of that. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm not going to go into the uh, the bloody details of it, but uh, you know, it was you just walk in to see just catastrophic damage from you know Mother Nature. And you see, you know, men, women, and children, you know, struggling, you know, you, all your heart goes out to them immediately. And you're just there just trying to make them smile, make them feel better. You know, me as a cook, you know, all I'm trying to do is, you know, hand little kids ice cream sandwiches or, you know, cooking something good to, you know, to make them feel better, you know, but you, you see the doctors down there, you know, they're, they're just glowing over their patients. Like they're, they are 100% on board with trying to make them better, you know. It's it's definitely crazy seeing a traumatic experience like that. It's amazing, amazing. I will say one thing too that uh, you are the recipient. I'm going to brag about you here. About you are the recipient of the Navy Marine Corps Commendation Medal, which is to be congratulated. That's not an easy thing to achieve. But you also are a recipient of the Navy Marine Corps Achievement Medal. And if you see a picture of Corey, which we will be posting that, if I'm not mistaken, Pete has that. He's got about 16 ribbons on his chest, and this is just a kid. What, Pete, Pete, you refer to him what, as the Doogie Hauser of the Navy? Well, you know, it's weird, because like hearing your voice, I can hear the experience, and I can hear the maturity. Oh, but my God, so the voice and the, and, the, and the curriculum vitae just do not line up at all. Right, but then like your, your picture, seriously, you look like it's a 12-year-old in the Navy's uh, uniform. Uh, I still get I still get carded for cigarettes. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's a blessing and a curse. But uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I've always been blessed with the good genes to look like uh, I'm young. You know, maybe when I get older, I can I can still pass it off. You know, but anyway, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm not taking it for granted. <laughs> so, uh, what are your plans? How much longer are you uh, currently tied to the Navy, and are you thinking about continuing? Um, you know, I, uh, I'm about to transfer here in about 10 months. I actually just got orders. I'm about to, uh, head to Sicily to uh -huh. Naval Air Station Siganella for a three year hitch. That's oh so no, that will be horrible. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, oh no. When he comes back from the <laughs> he can get all so, you know, I'm going to be over there. It's Mediterranean. So it's Mediterranean. So they got to be paying attention, but oh my gosh, to be, yeah, to be a cook stationed in Italy. That, that, yeah. yeah, you got to be working that out. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not mad about that one. You know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm about to head over there for a three year hitch. Uh, after that, um, that puts me over twenty uh, when I fulfill that tour. You know, uh, you know, my wife Amanda, she really uh, helped me out a lot during my career. She always made sure that to keep me going. So if there's still gas in the tank at the end of that one, cool. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll hitch a ride on another ship. Oh boy, know, nail the seven. Or if not, you know, hey, pack it up and come back home to the Keystone State. You know, it's been a while since I've uh, been a resident of there. So why not? You know, then I get to see you guys all the time. You know, what's there wrong you with go. that? There you go. That's awesome. Yeah, the, we're the getting less and Navy, less impressive. Man. The Gap Navy does need sailors. So we're <laughs> <laughs> on the mighty Susquehanna. <laughs> yeah, but you're always yep. scraping the corn squid and, you know, dealing with that stuff. <laughs> Now, I'm here to tell you, too, Corey, that med, med, Mediterranean duty is just some of the finest you'll ever have, really. I spent time in Rota, Spain at the, na at the uh, naval base. I spent time in Madrid and Morocco, of course, and did some tennis playing in Malta. So that was awesome. Mediterranean, you're going to love Italy. Oh, yeah. Man has already got a list. Three years, too. Jeez, that's hard. <laughs> yeah, she's already got a list. Yeah. <laughs> she's spending my money already, you know? <laughs> So yeah, Corey, when you're in a, in, a, in a place like that, is your um, is your wife allowed to go? I mean, how's it like on the personal side? You're not just separated, you know, twenty years, are you? No, no, no. Um, so there's there's a lot of common misconceptions about that, but you know, being a Navy spouse is not easy at all. You know, whether you're male or female, whatever role you're playing, um, 
when your spouse deploys, you know, you're pretty much a single parent or if you don't have kids, you're running the household while they're gone. And, you know, like I said, my wife has held me down for 18 years now. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be this far without her. And, you know, she's been through some long stretches at sea. She's been through some, some trying times and, you know, she's a rock. So I, I got very blessed with her. Is there a uh, sales pitch if there's any uh, young men or women out there in the uh, our audience that is thinking about a career that are interested in the Navy? Is there a, a sales pitch you could give them? <laughs> or say, don't uh, do it. <laughs> nah, I, you know, uh, honestly, you know, growing up in Lancaster, Columbia, you know, there wasn't really a lot of opportunities, um, especially if you went down a wrong path, you know. And uh, when you're young, you do stupid things. And, you know, the Navy gave me uh, an exit plan to sit there and give me a strategy of life and uh, give me confidence to, you know, not only just do a job, you know, give me a skill, but, you know, be a leader of men and women. And it's a fine institution. Don't get me wrong. But if you're going to come in, you're going to do some hard work and you can't be afraid of that. You know, I'm not a recruiter sitting here trying to sell you sunshine and rainbows and blow smoke up your ass. That's not my case. But, you know, the Navy will give you exactly what you give it is essentially what I'm saying. You know, it's 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 a good launch pad if you if you need the help. Well, Corey, I think I speak for the I mean, the other guys can speak for themselves, but uh, I think I speak for the other for the listeners. You know, generally I hear people say, oh, thank you for your service to people. And it's just. I don't know. It just becomes something that just is automatic and doesn't have anything behind it anymore. But hearing this stuff, you, um, I mean, thank you, thank you. This is, I mean, it really, you know, thank you for you doing know, that. It's 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 a humbling thing to, to hear that from out of the blue. But you know, um, I think it hits home a lot more when you see it coming from other veterans. You know, um, people that have been in the same uh, situations as you have, and you know, you just know just by the look in their eye that that that's what they mean when they say it to you, you know, it, some, in some cases it could be a little watered down, but nonetheless, it's, it's a true statement. You know, it, uh, when you hear people say, thank you for your service, you know, it, it, it means something to everybody that you say it to, but I don't know. It, it's, 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 it has kind of got watered down over the years and, you know, it's, I don't think of it as like, you know, I'm doing anything special, you know, essentially because, I'm sitting here wearing the rags of my country and I am serving and defending my, my people's way of life, you know? And if you want to thank me, cool, that's fine. That's not the intention, but you know, um, honestly, the veterans that came before me are the ones that you really should be looking at, you know, the world war one, world war two, Korea, you know, insert random conflicts that have happened that weren't major wars. You know, those guys did it in a time with less technology and, you know, just straight up hardcore people and they are slowly going away. Uh, a, a, re a generation of people that <laughs> were a lot harder than some of the people that are out here today. And those are the ones that we should be thanking for our service. You know, those are the ones that have paved the way for those of us that are here now. Um, yeah, that's, that's just how I feel about that. You know, Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, stick with us. We're uh, we're not kicking out. We're going to keep you here for the rest of the show. But we're going to take a quick <laughs> break. We're going to come back, hear a special feature. We're going to hear uh, some news. And then you're going to be blessed to hear Larry's chickens. <laughs> As far back as the mid-1800s, records exist describing the pre-meaning tradition of brethren smoking cigars during and after gatherings. To this day, the practice of smoking cigars remains very much alive in many lodges. This custom is considered a time for brethren to relax, exchange ideas, and enjoy the simplicity and fellowship that is the very essence of our brotherhood. This is what Hireman Solomon Cigars is all about. Our starting principles are to bring Masonic brethren together in the harmony of a good cigar. Pull up a chair, sit back, light up any of our premium cigars, and enjoy the history. Hireman Solomon Cigars can be found at fine cigar retailers. For a complete list, visit HiremanSolomonCigars.com 
or check them out on social media to find out when they'll be at a live event near you. Hireman Solomon Cigars is pleased to be the official cigar of the Masonic Light Podcast. Hello, brethren. Dutchy Duck is back with an update from my lodge, the Broken Pla, number 377. Well, COVID is still raging outside our doors, and once again we had a meet virtually for the month of January. This pandemic has definitely altered a lot of our lives and has upset the normal pace of things. We are also now in both a new Masonic year and a new calendar year. And that reminds me of a very famous story from our lodge's history. And since not much else is going on, I'm going to tell you all about an infamous January stated meeting back in 1954. Now what some of you might not know is that the Pennsylvania Dutch have a very specific meal that we eat on New Year's Day, pork and sauerkraut. The tradition states that if we eat this meal on New Year's, our New Year will be full of good luck. If we don't eat it, bad luck will follow us all the year long. Now you might be wondering why pork and sauerkraut? Well, let me explain. We eat pork because when a pig eats, it rutches its snot forwards as opposed to poultry, which scratch backwards. We want to go into the new year, not backwards, but forwards. Now why sauerkraut? Well, most people will tell you that it's because cabbage is green, symbolizing money and good luck. That's true, but I also think it has to do with the fact that a hundred years ago, before refrigeration, sauerkraut was one of the few vegetables that our forefathers had on hand in the middle of the window. Well, that and it's so damn delicious. It has been a long-standing tradition for our lodge to have a pork and sauerkraut meal at our January stated meeting. This tradition dates back to time immemorial. Now that you understand our traditions, let me take you back to January of 1954. Well, actually we have to go back to December of 1953 first. At the December meeting, brother Johnny Greekman had agreed that he and his wife would gladly prepare the upcoming pork and sauerkraut meal for the brethren. Now what you all need to know is that Brother Griegman had just returned from his service in the army in the Korean War earlier that September. And while in Korea, Brother Johnny fell in love with a young Korean girl, married her and brought her back home with him. Boy were his parents surprised. She was the only Pennsylvania Dutch woman with an Asian accent. And it also took Johnny's family a little while to get used to the fact that their new daughter-in-law ate with chopsticks instead of a fork and knife. Johnny's mum had never seen anything like it before. In any event, the evening of the January meeting had arrived. The brethren had assembled in the social hall for our traditional meal. As the food was brought out, something just didn't seem right. Where was that unique smell that only a big old pot of sauerkraut brings? It wasn't there. When the lids were removed, the brethren beheld a sight that many still remember clearly to this day. The sauerkraut was red. Yep, you guessed it. Brother Johnny's wife, when asked what sauerkraut was, was told that it was fermented cabbage. Well, to a Korean, fermented cabbage is kimchi. Kimchi is fermented cabbage, but it's made with peppers and other stuff that no Pennsylvania Dutchman had ever eaten before. Audible gasps were heard from the table. Brother Amos Lerbauch exclaimed, Hari, es ist noch einmal was ist sell? I can't translate that statement into English without losing this podcast G rating. But let me just say, he wasn't too happy. Everyone dropped their heads in disgust. If you don't know, we Pennsylvania Dutch are quite superstitious. So many of the brethren truly believed that their good luck had just flown out the window. What were they to do? Luckily, and astoundingly, in a matter of seconds, brother Peter Redder jumped up and said, No fear, brethren, I will be right back. Brother Pete ran out of the temple and in a matter of minutes quickly returned carrying a five-gallon ceramic crock. All of the brethren were wondering what he was doing. He placed the crock on the table and exclaimed, Have at it, boys. 
Yep, Brother Pete just happened to have five gallons of fresh sauerkraut in the back of his pickup truck. But in all honesty, what upstanding Pennsylvania Dutchman doesn't? The meal had been saved, the brethren's good luck had been restored, and they all forgave Brother Griekman and his lovely wife for the mistake. I hope that all of you had your pork and sauerkraut on New Year's and that 2021 will be full of good luck and some in-person Masonic events. But till next time, work hard, stay plumb, and out in the lights when you leave the room. To learn more about the Pennsylvania Dutch language, culture, and history, please visit my website, padutch101.com, or my YouTube channel. Just search Doug Maidenford. In Masonic news today, as COVID restrictions are gradually lifted, lodges across the jurisdiction are taking tentative steps to restart Masonic activity. Worshipful Master Hiram Mellinger of Redundant Lodge Number 111 recently contacted his district deputy to clarify a point of order. Is it permissible to hold a meeting nobody can remember the password. The district deputy could not be reached for comment, but 12 past masters each shouted a different answer from the sidelines. That's the Masonic News. So what it was. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, we may need a refresher course uh, when we all get back. Right? That's for everybody not in Pennsylvania that has to have a password. Right. <laughs> we can't well, remember I, the know, password it's, anyway. You know, it's funny because like Uber Grotto is so lax with everything. You know, when you go visit another grotto, they, they're they asking you for the password on the outside and the inside. Mm-hmm. And usually when I travel, there may or may not be some alcohol involved. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm sitting there with a district deputy pin on and a you know past monarch fez and I'm like oh yeah where am i <laughs> we usually get a I'm qualified for this i am i'm qualified all right what else have we got you gonna go around the horn i guess uh tim you probably have a list of things that uh district wide or <laughs> Well, you know, it's it as the, our brother Walter said, we are trying to jumpstart things again. Um, I mean, my lodge has been fairly active. When we look back last at last year, twenty twenty, we actually held eight stated meetings last year, which is amazing when you think about it. But we got our March meeting in before the shutdown, and we got our December meeting in before the next shutdown. So um, we were able to get, a, a, I, I dare say there are a few lodges that had that many meetings last year. Uh, we have, uh, on, as I mentioned, on February the 1st, stated meeting of Eureka West Shore Lodge number 302. Uh, we are opening with restricted uh, participation. Uh, we're limited to, I believe, 40 people in the room. Uh, based on the six-foot guidelines and so on, masks are required, as well as the COVID form needs to be turned in. If you've not done that before. On the 3rd and 4th of February, we are conferring, let me make sure I get this right, um, four firsts and a third degree across Ooh. those two nights. So, uh, yeah, it'll be a busy time in Mechanicsburg. Um And then on Friday evening, February the 5th, will be the next virtual meeting of the uh, Cigar Lodge number one. Um, If you, you can go to the Cigar Lodge uh, website or the Facebook page uh, to get the Zoom link for that. But I just got notice of that um, yesterday, I believe. So anyway, that's uh, what's coming up over the next week or so uh, for me, Masonically. Josh, or do you have anything going on? Uh, we have our uh, we have a meeting coming up next week for for Lamberton Lodge um, on on Tuesday. It'll be at our our stated meeting night. We're going to be doing that virtually, of course, via Zoom. 
So, but that's about it. Jack? Bob Kiss. Hey, Corey, uh, maybe not Masonically, but what do you have com- coming up in the next couple weeks? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm working, boss. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, actually, it looks like uh, we're going to be setting up uh, a vaccination site on board to try and uh, help some people out get this vaccine in. Can you bring that thing up to Susquehanna? Uh, probably not. The draft might not fit, but uh, you know, we, we could try. You know, tell your tell your senator and your governors and your request. You know, maybe. Yeah. I'll- okay. <laughs> Let's see. What do I? Have? I have uh, next week. I've got a Tall Cedars Executive Board meeting, which uh, should be thrilling. Um, and at the same time, I will be in Myrtle Beach golfing. So I'm sure I could do both. Um, and as far as appearances, Masonically podcast is going to be on Saturday, April 24th. We're going to be at that, at the Holiday Inn in Lancaster for the Pennsylvania Dutch farm degree. You guys are all welcome for a $20 donation. There'll be information. There's a a grotto event there too, right? It's also the Pennsylvania Grotto Association, uh, spring kerfuffle. So any uh, any Grotto members, uh, feel free to come to Lancaster and pick on all of us. And if you're not in Grotto, you probably can be by the end of the weekend. Oh, you betcha. Um, and then on June, June, what's the date here? 24? I don't know. We'll have, to have time to figure it out. But sometime in June, I think it's the 24th, we're going to be um, in Shrewsbury, at Shrewsbury Lodge number 423, they're having a car show. So we're going to be setting up a uh, tent in the parking lot like we're uh, setting up a flea market stand. So I'm going to oh, sell boy. any kind of random crap that I have laying around. Jack's going to sell random chocolate, and it should be a good time for all. And I guess that's it. What's Larry, what's Larry doing? Time to cue the chickens, I think. Larry is nothing Masonically. Oh, Larry, you doing anything? Oh, no, I have nothing, but nothing Masonically. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. No. Okay. No, we can't hear you. <laughs> we can't hear you, Larry. Oh, jeez. Hey. Time to go home, I believe. <laughs> Special thanks to our Ever Launch 665 for maintaining our beautiful studio we'll be back someday soon i hope also a special thanks to josh lamberton our producer director who always does a great show no matter how bad we do also to uh, jack harley our news director and tim Dedman, our marketing director special contributors doug Battenford, Dutchy doug michelle snyder and jim stevens and I have a couple announcements to make about staff hirings and staff goings. Our audience estimator, who we gave a job to about a year and a half ago, audience estimator Adam Illion. Adam Illion. I'm fond of the guy. He he, he does great numbers, millions. Uh, he's leaving us. Also, to our audience audience response analyst. Luke Warm left us to take a position at the Grand Lodge at Alparizo. Our budget director, Sasha Titus, is leaving us without a budget. <laughs> and our that's, staff accountant. That's a good one, Larry. I gotta give that's you that a good one. Good. Yeah. Our staff accountant, Candace B. Rittenhoff, wants to have a serious meeting with us. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Uh, that's really all I have to say. Uh, thanks for listening. This is Larry Maris. Have a good day and good night. Have a good night and a pleasant tomorrow. <laughs>